Welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, show number 185, where we interview Barbara Friedberg and get investment advice from a rock star investor. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Mindy Jensen, and with me as always is my suitcases full of cash co-host, Scott Trench. Do you think that these creative intros add to the show, Mindy, or do you think that they're just baggage? <laughs> I think they add to them. Oh, great. Scott and I are here to make financial independence less scary, less just for somebody else. We're here to introduce you to every money story because we truly believe that financial freedom is attainable for everyone, no matter when or where you're starting. That's right. Whether you want to retire early and travel the world, go on to make big time investments in assets like real estate, start your own business, or just simply build wealth over time and find that security you're looking for. We'll help you reach your financial goals and get money out of the way so that you can launch yourself towards those dreams. Scott, I am so excited to bring in Barb today. She is an absolute delight. I have known her for several years through FinCon, and I talk to her frequently as a panelist on a podcast called Money Tree Podcast, and she's just a delightful person to talk to. She's so smart. She even says it during the show today. She's like, I'm a smart woman. She is smart. She's very smart, and she's very clever, and it's just a fun trip down her story, starting in a position of um, unenviable poverty and ending up in a position where she has maybe not enough to her, but she definitely has enough for most. I, I really enjoyed the interview with Barb today. She, she's got a very uh, strong outlook on money and a really strong journey. Fundamentals consistently applied over a very long period of time and applied with extreme intelligence over the course of her investing and wealth building journey here over a very long period of time. My favorite part of today's interview was when we said, hey, debt yields are at all time lows, right? So you can't invest in bonds and expect to get any income. The stock market is at all-time highs with respect to P.E. ratios, right? It's or, or crazy highs relative to P.E. ratios. So you can't get any return out of the stock market. Real estate is just through the roof because interest rates are so low and prices are soaring across the country. And inflation is looming on the horizon, so I can't sit on any cash. What the heck kind of option does that leave you with? And I think she's got a great response to that. <laughs> yeah, she is... Not just off the cuff, she's very smart and thinks about her answers. And she's just got a lifelong knowledge base of information. And there's no surprises in this. She's not going to say you need to win the lottery. In fact, over her shoulder, there's a book called How to Get Rich Without Winning the Lottery. Um, and she's she's just all about starting early, making consistent contributions to your retirement accounts, saving money, spend less than you earn. Her comment about being happy with less, when you're happy with less, you will be happy with less. When you want more, you'll never be happy. And that's just really profound. And at the same time, like just it's common sense and everything about this episode is fabulous and fun. And you are going to love Barb as much as I do. Barb Friedberg, welcome to the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast. I am so excited to talk to you today. Thank you so much for having me, Mindy and Scott. I am ready to talk money, investing, and the secrets behind my story. Ooh, well, let's just jump right into it, Barb. Where does your journey with money begin? I got to say it begins when I was born because it starts with my mom and dad, who are my greatest inspiration. My parents were born in the Depression. My father was born in abject poverty. He started working when he was age 10, selling newspapers on the corner. He got his first bike by going as a child to a police auction by himself to bid on a bike. So my mom grew up middle-ish middle, middle -ish class, but the tone within my family was always to be very smart with your money. It was, you don't waste money. It's an important commodity, and it's really something that you value and you talk about. So that's the overall view that I, that I grew up with. 
Okay, everything that you said was not surprising until you got to the part that said you talk about it. That is fantastic because I grew up in a similar-ish uh, story. Um, my, I'm a grandchild of the Depression, and my parents never talked about money. I mean, they talked... I think one time my mom showed me how to balance a checkbook or something, but that's not anything like helpful in real life. That's not going to show you. I mean, they had money. So of course it balances. Like when I balance my first checkbook, I'm like, look at all those negatives. That's not good. <laughs> yeah. So you guys talked about it. How old were you when you first remembered them talking about money? I don't remember ever not talking about money. It was always within the conversation and a little side secret when I was a rebellious teenager, I thought they are so materialistic. Oh my gosh. Do they think about anything other than money? And you know, a few years later, here I am. What do I talk about? So, you know, don't mock your parents cause you're going to turn out like them. <laughs> so true. So true. So what does your financial position look like graduating high school and moving into college? Well, I always worked. So working was embedded and it wasn't something that came from the outside. I had the inner drive that I wanted to work. I wanted to be an adult. I wanted to be productive. So my graduating high school, I had actually inherited from a single aunt. I think it was about $7,000, which to me seemed like, you know, a ton of money. And I had saved up some money from working and from gifts and that kind of thing. So I had a start, you know, my bank balance wasn't negative. And I went to college at a time at a public university where you didn't need debt. So it's like it was another world than I know a lot of people are experiencing today. So I used part of my inheritance to help me pay for college. My parents helped pay for college. Again, I worked part time in the summers and always had a savings mentality. You know, yeah, I craved what everyone else had. And I had my mind that when I had money, I was going to get the fancy car and the fancy house and blah, blah, blah. And lo and behold, when I had money, it's like, I'm not wasting it on that stuff. So, yeah, that was me when I graduated high school and went into college. And so so what was the position upon graduating college? What did you get your degree in and, and how did you kind of start in the in the workplace? I graduated college with a degree in economics, and I graduated during a huge recession, not unlike the recession of the, like, recent 2008. And so there were no jobs. So I was like, oh, my God. So I took a, a secretarial job, and I worked for, you know, a, a moderate salary. Then I transitioned, and I said, I'm going to get my, my parents had a real estate business, so they they were actually uh, my my dad had a lot of different businesses but at the time that I graduated from college he had a brokerage company and he also had what is known today as a fix it and flip it you know we didn't have those names before but he bought dilapidated properties fixed them up and either rented them out or resold them so I said I'll get my real estate license so I started working in real estate and selling real estate and that was my love and, um, you know, kind of started making my way in the world. Mindy, you look like you have a huge question. I have a huge comment. Okay, so you said I went to school at a time where student loan debt, you didn't have to have student loan debt to graduate, which I love. I also went to school during that time. And um, I, you said I worked summers and did you say you worked during the school year too, part-time? Yeah, it's most of the time, not not 100%, but I always had a scheme. You know, I was, <laughs> I was always looking for an angle where I could make money. So at one time I would, um, I made, I, I loved crafts and sewing, so I made hippie shirts and sold them to my friends. <laughs> I worked as a tutor, you know, so I always had some sort of, 
angle going on. So yeah, I, I worked a lot during school as well, not full time. Okay, I just want to point out for people who are listening who have kids who aren't talking to their kids about money. Barb's parents talk to her ki- talk to her about money all the time. What did you say? I don't ever remember not talking about money. And then you didn't need to go into debt to graduate from college. You still work to pay and get money and you always had a scheme. I would love to see some of your hippie shirts because I have never met a person that I would consider less a hippie than Barb Friedberg. Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. I know. I've changed a lot. <laughs> a You're lot. You're so classy. You're a really classy woman. And I don't You're equate kind. hippies with class i don't know that's a horrible thing to say but come on <laughs> you know did they have signs in the 60s no hippies allowed like that yeah was... pretty much <laughs> you know but whatever yeah well, well so, so what, what i mean what i'm hearing from your story here is hey like this financial discipline was instilled early and often and there's a, a um you know there's a seven thousand dollar inheritance Um, college was paid for with that hard work and some assistance from mom and dad. And then those habits kind of continued straight on through after graduation, um, where you could find work and always, you know, applying a side hustle. And so what I'm curious is about is, do you have any sense of like the percentage of your income that you were able to save during those first few years out of college Yes, and how you kind of began approaching the wealth building game with that? Yes. And I want to share a story because in my mid 20s i met my husband my current husband and within two weeks i had taken over his finances so i know this is not typical but i was like you don't have an ira account come on get with it we need to open an ira i will be managing your money he said let's go shopping at you know one of the major department stores i said You're not going to the outlet mall? Come on. He's like, I don't shop at the outlet mall. I'm like, well, you're going to shop at the outlet mall now. And so your question was... So you guys didn't have the money talk before. (laughs) (laughs) No, we did not. You had it after. (laughs) Yes, we that that is a good point, Scott. (laughs) He paid full price for his car. So I'm like, I know. And you still married him? You, you're still oh, he's to such him? a wonderful guy. <laughs> he is the best ever. So this I'm is not one kidding. way to go about the money talk is you say, all right, we're married now and I got the money. Yes, <laughs> yes I'm the exactly. boss. You shop here now. <laughs> That's exactly how this. it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, so how much did we save? I always saved more than I could afford, literally. So I was the mass, we were the master of the hack. You know, how do you get a lot for a little? So actually when, after we had been married for a couple of years, my husband wanted to go back to graduate school and he has since gotten, you know, he got his PhD in psychology. He's been a child psychologist for many, many years. But at the time his graduate school, we had to come out to California, which was a really, really expensive place. And it was the tuition was very high in our minds. Not, I'm not going to tell you how much it is because you're going to say today, that's nothing. So I got a actually a really, really good job. I had gotten my master's degree in counseling um, before that and was a career counselor for a couple of years. Got a great job at San Diego State University. Contributed the maximum amount allowable by law to my 401k. So... We went actually to a financial planner at that time, and he said to me, I cannot believe how much you are saving. And I thought, you know, this is normal. So I have a lot of, I I just need to save. You know, to me, money is not what you can buy with it. Money is security. And if you have it, you feel more secure than not. So, you know, range saving from... 2015 to 40% of our income, pretty much always. You know, when we didn't have a lot of money, you know, it was more in the 
15 range. And sometimes we would dip a little bit into our savings to live just so we could fund that IRA, that IRA or the 401k. Okay, great. So you have a you have an X amount of months in your emergency reserve, and or or savings account. Whatever yes, you're referring to, and you're saying, hey, great, I I I will forego keeping that at the level that I want in order to fund my IRAs or other investment options. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. But I am so conservative by nature that we always had enough savings that would last us you know, should an emergency arrive, arise. Did you, how did you think about that amount? Did you think about that in terms of months of spending or did you think about that as a dollar sum or how, how did you think I about just your... always thought I need more money in my savings, you know, ah. so it wasn't <laughs> like, at that time, things, personal finance wasn't the industry that it is today. Mm-hmm. And there weren't all these rules. And so you didn't think, how many months do I need? It's like, I need a lot of money in my savings because I never know what's going to happen. So, you, so your savings account just continuously grew for yes. a long number of years, and you yes. continue to add to it while also adding to your IRA. Yes. Did you invest in anything else while you're doing this? When my husband got out of graduate school, and we were both working. You know, then we could start investing, and and I we had a brokerage account, and so we've always, you know, probably since my mid twenty, I've always had a brokerage account. So, um stocks, bonds, real estate, um, mutual funds. Yeah, we, we've been investing in everything for many, many, many years. So, so what, I, what, I'm, what, I, what I'm hearing is, is again, we have a, a good savings rate. We've got a good um, approach with money. It's, it's continuously piling up more. There's a lot more cash coming in than going out, and we're building that wealth and investing it across, we're, we're deploying that wealth across a, a continuously growing savings account, an IRA and a brokerage account where we're investing in stocks, bonds, and those types of things. Is that right? Yes. Was there an intent, for example, to retire early, or was there an intent to start a business or have have some sort of outcome with the wealth that you were building other than, you know, just continuing to build the wealth? Like, what was the, did that, did that just kind of, Go, continue for a while and, and add infinitum or was there like a was there an evolution of thought or, or how did that I, I don't know I guess this is an embarrassing yeah. question this yeah. is so embarrassing yeah. <laughs> do not tell anyone this okay <laughs> between the three of us um I have like really really modest tastes okay so I'm not looking for a second home I don't want to retire. Um, It's all, look, I'm not saying I don't spend money on things. There are things that are important that I want. You know, we've always owned our own home. We travel a fair amount. So there are things that we, we, we prioritize to spend our money on. And, you know, when we were raising our child, we spent a lot of money on her. You know, she had a sports and we really prioritize that. So those were the priorities. So we had to have money for those things. You know, we had to be able to afford to travel to visit our parents. We had to take a vacation every year. Um, so, but my husband also did consulting. So we'd pair his consulting jobs, you know, at different places with a vacation. So we were always savvy. But when you talk about a goal, I don't want to retire early. I don't want a second home. Um, one of my um, financial advisor friends once said, the end amount of money that you have, you always want about 30% more. And I thought that was so crazy because no matter what level you, you reach, you don't feel like it's enough. And I kind of resonate with that. I've got enough. I don't you know, foresee needing more. But there's always in your mind, well, it wouldn't hurt to have a little more because you never know what's going to happen. So in terms of these ultimate goals, I know the fire movement, excuse me here, I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail for this. I think that's stupid and it's indulgent because really on the majority, the mo- most of the people that can do that are people that are like earning one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand dollars a year and you know have fancy jobs or live in places that are really really cheap 
So it was never, can I retire early? You know, so. Well, let me ask you this, because because I, I think this is great. I think that's a, a great perspective. I completely respect it. I, let's just get inside the minds of someone listening, right? Who's starting out. <laughs> Who and, now and hates me. No, <laughs> and, and, and I'm, I'm listening to this. I'm, I'm 20 or 30 or, or maybe 40 with that. And I'm looking to build wealth and get really excited about that stuff. A big motivator of why, like the, the, the obsession with, with personal finance that I personally kind of went through was that idea of having the option to retire early. I am clearly not retired. I love my job. <laughs> Mindy is the same way, right? Uh, uh, you know, or so she tells me. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're, we're like, that's, that's the driver or the, the motivation behind that. Like what I, what I'm interested in learning is, is and that's taken for granted, I think by a lot of folks, perhaps me and Mindy included in some cases on the personal finance, like why you're listening to these shows and those kinds of things. But it seems like there's another motivation that's moving you. And how can we share what that motivation is or, or unpack it a little bit and, and, and access more people with this? Because it is a good outcome to just want to work for your entire adult life and be productive and, and amass a substantial net worth. So you have enough, should there be a problem or should you need it with those types of things? But I guess I'm just trying to get into and unpacking that motivation and how you, how that can fire somebody up uh, in addition to the fire movement. Well, first of all, I want to say something. I want to own up to something. I am privileged. Okay. A lot of people have not had the good fortune that I have. I recognize that and I appreciate that. You know, I had parents that trained me well. I didn't know people that took on a lot of debt. Um, I, you know, I, I've had a lot of good luck and I think luck is a part of this journey. So I don't want to say, oh, I did it all and I'm so great. No, I'm not. I had a lot of help along the way. I had a lot of good, good fortune. I have a husband who's wonderful, who supports me, who also has a good job. So I just want to put that out there. And so I have the luxury of being able to work at something I love. And I know a lot of people don't have that luxury. So I think I might have a different mindset if I had to work at something that I didn't love. And everyone cannot do that. So my internal motivation is a lot of the fact that I'm doing things that I love. And I know there's this, this common conversation that you find your passion and you'll never work a day in your life, blah, blah, blah. Well, that sounds really wonderful, but everyone can't do that. And some people just have to work at a job that they may not love to put food on the table. So does that answer it? Yeah, I love that. I want to go back to the comment you made a couple of minutes ago. You said the fire movement is indulgent and people who are part of it have fancy high paying jobs. And I think at the very beginning of that, that was really true. You've got all of these software engineers who are making $250,000 while being naturally frugal. My husband is this way. He was making a huge salary. We spend like 30 or $40,000 a year. That's, we just don't spend a lot of money. And that's with, you know, buying good beer instead of garbage beer and, you know, going on vacations, but we go on vacations with miles and points instead of dollars. Um, but still, we were part of this community because he had a job that he hated. He was, he was writing software for the VA hospitals. If you need a unit of blood, he wrote the software that makes sure that the blood you're getting is compatible with your body. You can die if you get the wrong kind of blood. So there's some <laughs> stress involved in that. Yeah. Um, wow. At one day he was uh, like doing some, some work and there was a bug and he's like, oh my God, I could kill somebody with this bug. I'm so freaking out. And then it turns out there wasn't a bug, but for like, five days he couldn't eat he couldn't sleep he was so stressed out and he's like i can't live like this anymore i gotta get out of this i gotta you know do something and we had been just like you we both grew up without a ton of money he grew up his dad was always uh, he was a union electrician in chicago so he would work through the summer and then get laid off in the winter when there was no jobs every single year so he grew up fi financially 
insecure, I would say, is the right way to, to phrase that. And you, you gravitate to this FIRE movement because you can become financially independent and then leave the job that you hate. I think a lot of people focus on the leave the job that you hate instead of the being financially independent so you have options. You said that you wanted more money because money's security, and it is. Because when I have a big fat bank account and my boss tells me I gotta work on Sunday every day for the next year, I can tell him, no, I'm not going to do that. And if he says, well, if you don't, you're fired, I can say, well, see you later and be okay with that. So having the financial security, I think, is something that should be more focused on than the retire early part. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that a lot of your background, you said your father was, brought, was born into abject poverty. I don't really think people, like millennials and, and people who are the, the younger generations realize just how awful the depression was. I mean, I remember going through my grandmother's things when she passed away and I'm like, why did she save this? Why did she save that? She saved it because you never know when you're going to be able to get that again. Like they saved everything. The elastic from underpants, like, oh, there's holes in the oh, underpants. Yeah. I'll cut out the elastic and be able Absolutely. to use that on something else. And now you've got people who throw away TVs because there's a little line down the middle. So it's, the mindset can be very different. And I think that growing up without having a lot of money really can mess with your head. And it's like, I think there's, there's really two two ways to phrase that, or I'm sorry, two ways to, to handle that. When you grow up without a lot of money, you are either hoarding money, which is a lot of the people in the FIRE community, or you are spending it like you can't make it fast enough because you never had anything before, so now you have to experience all the things. And I think that you obviously went to the former side, which is how I did that too. You know, we don't spend money. I would love a second home, but I don't live in color, uh, California. Do you live in California? Can I do. I say that? Yeah. Yes. So you live in California. That's kind of a beautiful place to live. You know. Yeah. That is I don't need another home. home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, that is I where don't everybody need has another... their second home. Right. So you know, I just I think that that is there's a lot of things to consider, and not just you know, not just the retire early part. I really really want everybody to be financially independent so they can make decisions that, you know, are smart and and you know then then you don't have to work the job you hate. You can work the job you love, which is what I do. Very good point. Very well put. Barb, you know, during your journey, it, it seems like there was no there was no necessarily end goal with the wealth accumulation. It seemed more like a no. process and yeah. making sure that there was more and more security. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And what I'm interested in is, um, I understand you're a business owner at this point. Is that is that also right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So could you walk us through maybe how your financial position opened up kind of career and business options for you throughout your journey? Like perhaps was it, was, was, uh, the decision to maybe go into business for yourself related to, um, a feeling of security with some of that, the, those financials or, or could, is there any, is there any commentary around that, that maybe is, is a part of your story? Well, I've, I got my MBA when I was older. Okay, so I've always had a, a, a passion for business. And I kind of fell into it because after I got my MBA, I had the option I can go work for a corporation. And, you know, I had already been an investment portfolio manager before I got my MBA and got my MBA during that time. And then there was a chance where I could do another job or something like that, or I could transition into something else. But I really, it just didn't, I didn't find anything that I really wanted to do. I didn't want to work a 60 hour a week. So I kind of, you know, cobbled together, started writing online. And from that initial blog, which I started, which was Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance. I still have that. A business has grown. So I've written books, both self and other public, uh, published. I've started another website, Robo Advisor Pros, where I cover all the Robo Advisor field. Then companies have contacted me because they want me to consult on the Robo Advisor industry. I've done a lot of freelance writing because I like to write about investing, for major publications. 
So I didn't say, oh, I'm going to start a business. It was kind of something that evolved. Okay, got it. So so this was kind of like a side hustle while working your full-time job it started as? And yeah, then kind of yeah, and then that. kind of transitioned, left my full-time job and turned into something else. Like so you are like part you... of the fire movement. <laughs> Right. Well, you were financially you know, independent. You retired yeah, okay. early from that other job, and now you have oh, your own job. Okay, except <laughs> the early part is kind of subjective. You know, I know I look 25, but really I'm not. Same. I have that same problem. <laughs> yes, um, it is a problem. <laughs> so, and I, you know what, I do think that's important to note. When you were starting investing, when you were saving in your savings account, I remember double digit interest rates for your own personal investments, as well as for, you know, when you're getting a mortgage. Um, My entire college was funded by my parents buying me savings bonds as a kid. Yes. And then in second grade, I had to sit down and sign this stack, like literally this much, sign this stack of savings bonds with my name on it, not get any money. And then my dad put it into a, some sort of, uh, oh, a 10-year CD at 15% mm-hmm. interest. Yes, yes, yes. Those were and the then, interest rates in the 80s. Yeah. And then at it the was end insane. of the time uh, that I graduated high school in 1990, and then they became, uh, the bond was up, and the guy's like, hey, Dad, do you want to do, the, do you want to extend this? He's like, can you give me another 15%? And they're like, no. <laughs> But- yeah, it's it's a it's a, a total it's crazy that interest rates were in the double digits. A 6% mortgage used to be like so cheap. So we're in a, a totally different world t- today than, you know, a generation ago. What what kind of advice would you say for what you would have for folks looking to begin building wealth or or, or repeating kind of your um, successes that you've had over your career that it's, and again, it sounds like it's, it's based on frugality, bringing in, spending less than you bring in and investing very consistently over a long period of time with a, a security emphasis and a, and a cash position, a strong cash position, a financial fortress that you built early and maintained in perpetuity with that. But like, what, what advice would you have for folks that are looking to repeat that story? I think the, the first place to start is with your mind because if you want less you can become happier with less you don't have to covet your neighbor's bmw or tesla and you can be happy driving a 20 year old car and feel like i don't need to impress anyone so first you have to know what's important to you and you have to figure out okay i'll spend on what's important to me but not what's important to other people and that's where you start, because as long as you're covering, coveting more and more and more and more, you will spend more and more and more. And, you know, avoid really expensive hobbies, you know? <laughs> Don't buy more house than you can afford. Don't buy a fancy car unless you can afford it and meet your savings and investing goals. So that's where I would start. Mm. I love it. The mindset is is so important, and you know the, the concept. One of the concepts you have that brings to mind is the idea of hedonic adaptation, which is a big uh, point that Mister Money Mustache likes to make, and uh, something that I read on his blog a while back. But it's like, hey, regardless of what you've got, if you can learn to be happy with what you've got, you're gonna be you're gonna be happy. If you're always wanting more, you can buy more, and you're going to be just as unhappy as you are today within two weeks after buying that new car or the bigger house or the the fancy doodad or whatever. There is no end to the hedonic treadmill, which is something that you can Google and learn about if you're listening um, <laughs> um, on that. Well, we'll put so, a link to that that's, in the show notes. But yeah, yeah, that is so – that concept sums it up, Scott. That is just perfect. 
Yeah, and 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 the you know I I think that there's a lot more time and optionality to pursue happiness once you're in a position of security, whatever that means to you. So some for some people that security, um, it sounds like you've reached that point of security, Barb. And it sounds like some folks might reach that when they hit the four percent rule for fire, or they might reach it long after that, or even before that, depending on how that has to go. And so I think that's a great place to be because the pursuit of happiness probably seems more attainable from that position. Well, and I, I want to throw something else out is because on paper I'm secure, but psychologically there's always anxiety. You know, you always worry, well, you can't control the future. And particularly during this past year of COVID, you learn there's a lot you cannot control. And so that's where you have to get back to controlling your mind because there's so many factors that are uncontrollable. And the security is great, but you also have to train yourself to realize that you've got to be able to accept uncertainty in your life. Barb, what gives you anxiety right now about um, with, with regards to finance? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I guess the biggest thing that scares me is having some sort of medical emergency that's something or some i think the medical emergency is is the most because that is something that can rip through your finances like mad and you have in, you have insurance and you know we have long term care policy as well but it's not 100% so that's that's the one thing that is outside my control um, going back to your journey a little bit here, what, how important were any outsized investment winners for you on your wealth building journey? Do you have any that you can recall or, or, or talk about directionally? I do. I do. And I, I think that's a super question, Scott, because the one thing I like to put out there to, when people talk about investing is you have to be diversified because every investor knows that not every investment is going to be a home run and you can kind of ex expect that you'll have some outside winners and you will have some horrible losers and then the rest if they kind of stay in the middle you're going to come out ahead so my big one of my biggest winners was investing in oracle i don't even remember when i first invested in it, it might have been in the 90s and that was before i switched to a more passive index fund investment approach and oh gosh it must have quintupled and so I sold about half and then hung on to the rest so that was I'd say among my biggest winners my current house is one of my is not it's not an investment but it's a very nice gain because we bought our house in a short sale 10 years ago and Ooh. in California, and so it is appreciated nicely. Yeah, that's awesome with with the uh, the housing the housing stuff there. I love what you said that before you switched over to passive index fund investing. But my understanding is that that has that really gained traction as a all approach in the '90s, 2000s. You know, kind of in general and in, in, in more of a mainstream fashion. What was your evolution thinking like with respect to that? And how did that kind of... That is a, another oh. wonderful question. I, as a portfolio manager, I researched individual stocks and bonds and, and really invest in a, a stock portfolio. I'm really good at fundamental analysis and valuing companies, et cetera, et cetera. So I went to my MBA program and I'm like, the finance professor says, who thinks they can beat the market? And I'm like, my hand shoots up. Oh, yeah, I can beat the market. I'm a great <laughs> investor, blah, 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 blah. And she said, well, let's talk about the research. And what I subsequently found was about 30% of active investment managers beat the investment markets every year. 70% 70% of the time, index fund investing works. So, and the problem with that is if you say, okay, well, I'll go with those 30% 30, 30 of investors that beat the market every year. 
It's not the same ones every year. So I'm, I'm very smart. I looked at the probabilities and it was like, oh my gosh, I'm doing all this work. And yeah, most of the time I, I do pretty well, but the risk reward for me was if I can invest in a diversified grouping of passive index funds and rebalance it back to an allocation, which means a percentage invested in each of the different types of assets, stock, stock funds, bond funds, value funds, international, real estate funds, then I have a likelihood of getting a market return in all of those assets. And the market returns on those assets typically beat 70% of actively managed portfolios. So I had a huge aha moment. Now I still own a couple stocks that I could not part with. Um, I just never could seem to sell them. And one is Lowe's, one is Stryker which is a medical company, and they've done very well, and I, I still can't see a reason to sell. I'm not going to buy more. Oh, so you keep Actually, answering all of my questions as I'm typing, and we have a, a document that we type our questions in together. I'm like, ooh, I wonder what she thinks of index funds. You're like, and that's when I move to passive index funds. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I guess she likes them. And I'm like, oh, I wonder if she does any individual stocks now. And... <laughs> Let, let me let me just kind of share. Can I? I want to read an excerpt from something that I um, I'm a big fan of here that I think really emphasizes your point, Barb. And this is from from Warren Buffett. So this will be 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds. We'll see. Um, I'd like you to imagine a national coin flipping contest. Let's assume we get 225 million Americans up tomorrow morning, and we ask them all to wager a dollar. They go out in the morning at sunrise, and they call the flip of a coin. If they call it correctly, they'll win a dollar from those who called wrong. Each day, the losers drop out, and on the subsequent day, the stakes build as all previous winnings are put on the line. After 10 flips on 10 mornings, there'll be approximately 220,000 people in the, in the country who have correctly called 10 flips in a row. These are the 30% of fund managers, by the way, that Barb mentioned earlier, um, who beat the market that year. Each of those 220,000 people have won over $1,000. Now, this group's going to get start getting a little puffed up about this, human nature being what it is. They may try to be modest, but at cocktail parties, they'll occasionally admit to the attractive members of the opposite sex what their technique is <laughs> and what marvelous insights they bring to the field of flipping. Assuming that the winners get getting the appropriate rewards from the losers, in another 10 days, we'll have 215 people who have successfully called their coin flips 20 times in a row, and who, by this exercise, have each turned $1 into a little over $1 million. 225 million would have been lost, 225 million would have been won. By then, this group will really lose their heads. They'll probably write books on how I turned a dollar into a million in 20 days working 30 seconds a morning. Worse yet, <laughs> they'll probably start jetting around the country attending seminars on efficient coin flipping and tack tackling skeptical professors with, if it can't be done, why are there 215 of us? So this, I think, really sums up the... Uh, passive investing portfolio. Now he goes on to say, hey, if all some of those coin flippers happen to be all from the same zoo in Omaha, maybe you start looking at them for something that actually does separate them. Maybe there is something special about their coin flipping prowess. But absent that, or absent anything that you can detect unifying it, why do you believe that the past, the active fund managers, given the statistics, are anything better than the, the ones who outperformed the market, are anything better than the ones who picked stocks that happened to do better that year, and will have no more than a 50-50 or, or even 30% shot at outperforming the market the next year. And that, that's why I don't invest with active fund managers and instead invest in passive index funds. And I think that really emphasizes your point. So thank you. I was probably a little bit longer than 90 seconds, but... <laughs> My point is made. I'll bow out politely now. I love that. That was wonderful, Scott. <laughs> I'll, so, I'll link to that 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 article in the show notes here. Uh, that would be fantastic. I think you've brought that up before, and I don't know if we've ever linked to that article. Uh, but yes, please include that in the show notes. Um, so I hear people listening in the car saying, oh, well, I chose XYZ stock, and I'm doing really well with it. So there's always this this, uh, I don't know, drive to prove yourself, but like, oh, I could do better than that. I could do better than that. What percentage does Barb Friedberg think is okay to dabble in, in, in uh, individual stocks? Uh, what percentage of, of a portfolio? And zero is a valid answer if you want to say sure, that. Sure, sure. 
And I think that's a wonderful question because I don't think anyone's like perfectly disciplined and there's something fun about trying your luck in investing or trying out these new platforms or portfolios or seeing what you can do with, you know, maybe a more speculative investment. So my rule of thumb is 5%. So take 5% of your investment portfolio and do whatever you want with it. Maybe you'll hit a home run. If you lose it all, you won't be in terrible shape. Okay, I like that answer a lot. Barbara, let me ask you this question. So when I when I first started out my journey, I, I saved up twenty grand, and I put it all on a duplex. I put it all into a house hack duplex. I didn't. I had no diversification, and my belief was that if I bought this duplex, moved in, fixed it up, lived in half, rented out the other half, and lived for free, that that would be a far better use of my investing proceeds than a diversified portfolio. And so how do you feel about the index fund? What, I, what I'm asking this is, I, if, I'm, if I'm putting myself in the, picture, in the shoes of somebody who's listening right now and is just getting started with their first five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000, the index fund strategy is very unappealing because, great, I'm going to make 10% on ten grand. that's $1,000 next year. That is not very exciting. That's not going to make any change to my life. It's going to take me a very long time. Do you have any advice for people who are just getting started out on whether there is a place to lack that diversification, go all in on something that can make a bigger uh, outcome for them in the early days? Or do you kind of uh, 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 prefer the slow and steady pilot on approach in the index funds? Scott, your, your approach wins my vote. And I'll tell you why. First of all, you're not, you're living free. Okay. So eventually your mortgage is going to be paid off. You're getting rent. So you're getting paid to live. So anytime you can slash your housing and your um, cost of living, then that is a brilliant investment. Now, Scott, just out of curiosity, where do you live? Denver, Colorado. Okay, awesome. So Denver, you can get a, you know, a reasonably priced home and make that work. Unfortunately, this is what people from California think. Right. (laughs) Well, I unfortunately live in the most expensive area of the country, which is like daunting to someone who was born in the Midwest. But um, so location matters. But I would say if you can afford to do what Scott did with your first $10,000, that's a no brainer. Do that. Do that for sure. That's an an immediate win. Okay. Okay. Great. So it sounds like there are some some cases, especially in the early days, where diversification. Like that's where it comes to. Like diversification ensures average results. That's awesome for me with my stock portfolio because I don't think I can get those outsized returns. And an average result on a big pile of money that I've been accumulating year after year after year is wonderful and really secure. And, and I feel great, great about that. But in the early days, you guarantee yourself very slow progress with yes. a diversified approach, which I think is the fundamental challenge for a lot of folks. That's, um, very, that's very true. And that's actually a big negative for some of these small change apps, which they invest the difference between like your purchase and a dollar. So you're, you're investing 25 cents a day. It's going to take you forever to build up any sort of money with that. So... If there's a way that you can get a hack to get yourself some capital to start, you will save yourself some, I mean, you'll, you'll get a leg up, whether it be a side hustle. Like if you have a side hustle and you don't need that money, you can build up a lot of money more quickly if you can earn an extra thousand dollars a month starting a website or something like that keep your day job your spouse keep his keeps their day job and then you've got a thousand dollars a month to build up so that um you're you're making your wealth building process a little bit faster but yeah it's very you know starting with ten thousand dollars and then waiting for it to compound it's like watching grass grow. Love it. That's that's <laughs> awesome. I love I love that that uh, that that analogy there. Okay, so let me ask you another question. I'm just fi- firing now in random directions um, because I've been enjoying picking your brain on this stuff. But um, 
I let's suppose that I have a um, that for the last ten years I've been slowly building and investing and honing this, and I've recently kind of come around to the the idea of passive investing, and I've got holdings in other companies that have been huge winners for me, such as a I bought Tesla or I bought. Um, you know, Amazon or Facebook or whatever it is, right? And so I, now I've now I'm like, okay, well, things are going pretty well. I'm sitting on like 200 grand in these stocks, but I'm way overweighted towards them. Um, if I sell them, I incur taxes and have to change those things over. If I don't sell them, I have this weird portfolio where I'm half in index funds and half in these huge companies um, that have been great for me. So I've got a great problem. What do I do in that situation? That's a wonderful question because a lot of young people are in that situation right now. They've like built a, built up enormous amounts of money in very narrow positions. And they're like, I can't sell this. It's, it's only going to go to the moon. And if you're a huge risk taker and you don't care if, you know, it tanks 50% and you can live with that, then don't do anything. If you're more, less... <laughs> You know, the risk tolerance goes from like very conservative to very risk, you know, comfortable with risk, very aggressive. So I'd say for most people, we're somewhere in the middle. What I typically recommend is sell half of the positions, you know, so you lock in your gains. So sell half the Tesla, sell half the Bitcoin, sell half the Facebook and diversify with that. And we've got another situation now that the markets are very, very, very overvalued. I believe in the next couple of years, we have a greater likelihood of a market decline than we do greater advances. Now, I could be wrong. Don't quote me on that. And you will feel a lot better. There's nothing even wrong with taking some cash out, you know, and just saying, you know, I'm just going to take some of my profits, pay the tax on it because... That's what you do and sit with some cash for a while so I can think. Do, do you have any tax advantaged approaches to doing that? Like, are there, are there ways to kind of avoid the, the capital gain on, on some of those things? Invest because... in a retirement account, you know, um, or, uh, other than that, I mean, with real estate, you know, you've got the 1031 exchange with, which may be leaving under the Biden administration. But with stocks, you know, when you sell in a taxable account, you owe the tax. So yeah, you really, you really can't afford that. Fortunately, the capital gains rates are lower than they have ever been in probably a decade. So literally, you're better off selling now than waiting for you know, maybe sometime in the future, they're going to go up and you'll pay more tax in the future. But that's just part of doing business. You can't avoid paying taxes. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, Barb, interest rates, I'm just I'm peppering questions now with this. Yeah, um, sure. So I interest rates are really low. So, get, you know, buying bonds seems like I'm not going to get very much income. Um, stock market is really overpriced, right? Uh, or, or it's at a very low PE ratio or very high PE ratio, right? Where I've got a, uh, a very little income being generated by per dollar invested there. Real estate prices are at all times highs because of, um, the, the low interest rates that are, that are here and that are making them that much more affordable for home buyers and, and landlords and those types of things. So where, where, how do I think about that? If that's terrifying me from an investment approach perspective. I resonate with that because you have to look at your money in terms of short, medium, and long term. Any money you need within the next five years, I wouldn't put it in the stock market. If you're saving up for a home and you've got, you know, some money in the stock market and you think, oh, I'll just put this in my down payment in two years. Well, if you lose 30% of that money, you're going to be really upset. So money you need for the short term, bite the bullet, put it in a CD or a money market fund. You're not going to earn any interest, but you're not going to lose any principal. Mm. Money that you need for 10 years, well, you know, or for retirement, keep it invested in the markets and realize there are ups and downs, but timing the market is really, really hard. 
And then if there's money you need in like seven years, that's kind of a tougher call. And I might just pull some out into cash and leave the rest there to see what happens. So let me, let me ask you another, another tr- tricky question with this. So pulling some out in cash and seeing what happens, you know, what if, what if all of these prices are still too low because the looming thing on the horizon that it seems like the market is, is betting on is, is inflation. So that means that if I take out cash, I'm also in a really risky position. So I can't win on any of those four alternatives, That's bonds, true. stocks, real estate, or cash. Yes. What do I do? Like, you are uh, absolutely correct. And that is why we are diversified. Because I was looking at some research by Jeremy Grantham at his GMO um, fund. He's a brilliant guy. And he did asset projections for the next seven years for major asset classes. And every single U.S. and global asset class showed negative returns for the next seven years with the exception of international, no, emerging market value stocks, Mm. which, look, this is one guy. It's not a guarantee, but it brings up the point we are in a very unusual situation. What, What my personal belief is, and this is, you know, you may or may not agree with me, is, yeah, Inflation may kick up, but if I need money in the next five years, I want to have cash. Yeah, I might lose a little bit per year due to inflation, but if I leave it in the stock market and I lose 30% next year and 20% the year after, like the S&P 500 lost in 2000 and 2001, I will be much happier in cash than I will in the stock market. So it's all about risk mitigation and diversification and the length of your time horizon. Mm. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who have been riding this extremely long wave that we've been having since, what, 2012, is that? Is it, when did it start going back up? Because it was dropping. Oh, it started going back up in nine? Yes. Okay. So that's, uh, what is that, 11 years? That's a really long time. That's a, uh, and a lot of people, especially people like Scott, who are younger, this is the only market they've ever known. He graduated, when did you graduate from high school, Scott? Uh, I graduated in, from high school in 2009. Oh. So oh, I, had, I, mean, I had, you know, getting high school jobs was not very fun, but you know, <laughs> yeah. I graduated from college in 2013, which is, which is fine. It was a great economy and, and it's been booming ever since I began investing both in the real estate and stock market. So I've only ever known that. And I've only ever also known the fear of, wow, this booming market is going to come to an end. And the depression, the, 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 the pundits are always, I have a list of them, um, you know, articles from the last 10 years, you know, and it's always the, the, the bubble is about to pop in about 18 to exactly. uh, 24 months. Right. Yes. And so I've got articles predicting that from 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And then a uh, recent article just said basically the same thing again. So one of the days, one of these days, the pundits is going to be right and they're going to do that. So I, I know the fear, but I don't, I haven't actually experienced that huge drop except for with the exception of that uh, market crash that Mindy called to the T uh, in uh, March of 2020. Yes, we all know about her predictive abilities. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I blew it all in one shot right there. Uh, but yeah, I think that that you know you cannot continue to expect these unbelievably ridiculous gains that we have had over the last 11 years. And when people who have been investing in this market only start to experience that, I think they're going to be in for a shock. And I I love your concept of thinking in short, medium, and long term, you are still going to need to retire at some point or you know, be able to pay for retirement when you don't have a job anymore. Even if that's not early retirement, even if it's 65, 70, 75, you're still gonna need money to live at that time. So putting something in the stock market right now is a good bet because the stock market goes up and to the right, not every year, not every day, but over the course of time, it goes up and to the right. And I am a firm believer that it will continue over the course of time to go up and to the right. Past performance is not indicative of future gains, but I'm a big believer in 
the country of America and the the stock market that I'm investing in is the American stock market and I really think it's going to continue over the long haul to grow. Short term, I have some money in, you know, uh savings accounts, but they're paying nothing. Um I don't have any I don't know what I'm thinking about in medium term. I haven't I haven't thought about medium term money. Um but yeah, I guess I just wanted to to throw that out there that you know you do I I do still believe in investing in the stock market, but you know yeah when you need it in the short term, don't put it in the stock market because imagine you needed to pull money out at the end of March, last year, now you lost all this money you know lost it it did come back but did anybody predict that it was going to come back in like thirty days or whatever ridiculous bounce it came back in? Yeah, I think it just all comes back to like let's spend less than we earn build up a, a, a strong emergency reserve, invest consistently but not aggressively for the long run where we can, um, and maybe start with a house hack <laughs> um, as part of that. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. We all agree. So. <laughs> okay, well, let's look at where Barb is investing her money. She talked about index funds. You talked about a couple of um, long-term stocks. What does your... Uh, what does your investment portfolio look like in terms of percentages? I have probably a 65 stock, 35 fixed portfolio. And in the fixed portion, I have some bond investments, which are bond funds that I have some municipal bond funds. I have some bond funds that have a term so they have all the bonds they're etfs and they have they're by iShares and they have a term so one one term is up at a, a maturity date so they're funds but they act like an individual bond so it goes up in december of 2021 i have another one i kind of ladder them another one that comes due in 2023. So that way, if interest rates are higher, I can reinvest that fixed money in other bond funds with higher returns. On the stock side, I have U.S. diversified index funds. Um, I have a I have SPY, which is S, the standard in pours. I have VTI, which is Vanguard's total market. I have RSP, which is an equal weight U.S. stock market fund, which will favor more value stocks because it is not market capitalization, which means, for those of you who don't know, most of your index funds are market capitalization weighted, which means the bigger companies have a greater weight than the smaller companies. Then I also invest internationally. Oh, wait, in the US, I also invest in some small caps, some small cap value, mutual uh, ETFs, mid cap, and then REITs, US REITs, just a diversified US real estate investment trust. Then I have international holdings, a broadly diversified stock index fund, developed market, emerging markets, and I did have an international REIT stock mar- uh, real estate fund, which I sold just the returns were horrible. I'll probably regret it because now they'll probably go up since I sold it. So that's kind of, <laughs> so just in a summary, I have a diversified uh, U.S. and global stock and bond portfolio weighted towards small caps and value because historically value stocks have done better than um, growth stocks, although not recently. Do you, yeah. Do you... um? Do you ha- so it sounds like most of this portfolio is going to be publicly traded securities managed yes. through your brokerage account and IRAs. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. That is correct. Do, do you have other assets? I also have a couple of robo-advisors. Okay, great. <laughs> um, I, I do have to put a plug for that. I love robo-advisors. I review them. I think they are wonderful. And I do have a couple of them myself. Do, do you have um, other assets outside of those 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 things? Like, like for example, you mentioned you have a house in California, you have a business, you have a cash position. Is there anything else maybe beyond those, or could you walk through no. those other assets? No, I do not at present. 
I get pitched, I look at all the time. Private investment opportunities, investment opportunities and alternative types of platforms, crowdfunding. I did have two debt crowdfunding platforms that I am, um, they're long-term holdings, so you can't sell those until all of the loans within those uh, platforms come due. So I invested in those probably eight years ago, and I am now taking my money out of those because I, I just don't like the returns for the amount of risk, a lot of defaults. So that's the really only alternative crowdfunded type of investment that I have. Oh, nice. We're so in the same club I have, there. I, I actually lost a, a good amount of money uh, through a dead crowdfunding portal myself. Uh, it doesn't sound oh, like you yeah. lost money, but yeah, um, that was fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we all have losses, and that's that's a reality. And yep. um, yeah, at first I was getting like 9% returns. By the end, I was getting 3% returns, and it's like, I don't need this, you know? So yeah. I'm I'm unrolling my position. And I feel like I, although I always get excited, I'm on the Money Tree Investing podcast and we get all these opportunities. And every time I hear someone, it's like, this sounds fabulous. I've got to invest. But when it gets down to it, I try to keep my life kind of simple. And a lot of these other type of investment platforms require a lot more due diligence. And because a lot of them are not regulated in the same way that the public markets are. So I'm not saying I'll never invest in a private investment, but I've just haven't done that right now. Got it. I like, I like that comment. You have to do your due diligence. Don't just hear about some hot new investment and be like, Ooh, I'm totally going to jump in with that. Cause you could lose everything if you don't know what you're doing. And um, I think that's really great to remember. Uh, okay. Barb, in terms of monthly spending, how many months do you keep on hand in cash or other easily liquidatable uh, funds? Well, you have to remember that I'm a lot older than your um, your typical your typical um, you know viewers, and you also have to remember that I'm in I'm in the retire I'm in the sphere where people retire. And so I always have in the back of my mind, well, maybe I will want to retire. And my husband, you know, as well, he's like, you know, maybe we'll want to retire. So I preface that. So we have two years. Okay. I think that is uh, a really important question because I think there's a lot of people out there who don't have adequate cash reserves. And there's this idea, oh, I can't have any money just sitting around. I need to have every dollar working for me. And no, sometimes your dollars are working for you by sitting there waiting to be deployed in an emergency. And if you can't cash yeah. flow almost any emergency, you should have some dollars sitting to the side. So I like that answer. I like that answer. Um, okay, it is now time for our famous four questions. These are the same four questions we ask of all of our guests. Barb, are you ready? Yes. This has been delightful, by the way. I really enjoyed your you being this here today. This has been so fun. I could talk to you guys all day, although I'm sure the listeners would be totally bored by the end. <laughs> okay, Barb, what is your favorite finance book? The Elements of Investing by Malkiel and Ellis. It's 100 pages, and it is an easy read, and I think everyone should read it. All right. I haven't heard of that one before, so that's an interesting. I'll go check that out. What was your biggest money mistake? I think it was a house that we bought in Indiana. We had back in a um, long time ago. We used to live in California and we lived there for 10 years. And after our daughter was born, we decided we wanted to get off the rat race and move back to the Midwest where we could raise a child without both of us having to work full time. So we took a job in India. My husband took a job in Indiana with the intent I would stay home with our, our daughter. And because the dollar bought so much more in Indiana than it did in California, we bought a huge house. Brand new, beautiful, decorated it just the way I liked it. Modern, um, contemporary, 
think Indiana. Okay. <laughs> Is that the style that goes in Indiana? Then the job was not great. In fact, my husband didn't like it at all. So two years later, we were ready to move. Put the house on the market and people didn't like it. Finally, we got, and this is so important, we got a realtor who said to us, well, I have someone who wants to make an offer, but it's, oh, I think it was like a 10%, we would have taken a 10% loss if we took it. And I'm like, no, we don't want that offer. Long story short, we ended up selling the house for a $25,000 loss. We should have taken that offer. And my lesson is that when someone says, I have someone that wants to make an offer, get them to put it on paper because then you can always negotiate. If you say no, you have no choice. So that was a huge learning experience and a very big mistake. And then we ended up selling it for a $25,000 loss. Sounds like you got ho- hoos- hosed on this on hoos- we got, on this We on got this hoosed, that <laughs> is right. Yeah. Yeah. And another yeah. piece of advice, if you're decorating in Indiana, probably don't want to go for a really modern look. More traditional is big in Indiana. That is still good advice to this day. I used to live uh, near Indiana, just on the Illinois side, and yeah. Not a lot of design uh, trailblazing there. Yeah. Uh, okay, besides that piece of advice, what is your best piece of advice for people who are just starting out? Gosh, I could talk to you guys forever, and I would love to, but if you are just starting out, be patient. Do the smart things. Financial success takes time. And you're not going to get there overnight. So balance out how you want to live today with saving and planning for the future. So save part of your money, invest in your 401k, create an emergency fund of at least six months. And if you can, set up a brokerage account as well. Have your money automatically transferred out of your paycheck. If you can't see it, you'll be it'll be easier to live on what's left in your checking account. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, great advice. What, what, what is your favorite joke to tell at parties? I am the worst joke teller ever, Scott. You're gonna have to, you're gonna have to. I'm I'm handing you the <laughs> reins, Scott. I, I I can't do it. You're gonna All regret right, here, that. Here is a gem that we got um, from Anonymous. <laughs> I got hit in the head with a can of soda yesterday, but luckily for me, it was a soft drink. Okay. <laughs> I got to do that people, one. <laughs> where can people find out more about you? <laughs> I would love to hear from you. So you can find me at Barbara Friedberg Personal Finance, Robo Advisor Pros, and my brand new YouTube channel, called Barbara Friedberg. I have 200 subscribers. And I know that does not sound like a lot, but I have to tell you guys, I love those 200 subscribers. All right, well, go check them out and we'll link to all three of those areas on in the show notes. Uh, yeah, those this show notes awesome. can be found at biggerpockets.com slash money show 185. Barb, this was fabulous. I knew having you on was going to be fun, but I didn't know it was going to be this fun. I'm so pleased to be able to spend time with you today. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Thank you for having me. You guys have just made my month. So, <laughs> all right. Thrilled to be here. It's the first day of the month, so or like a second, one of those. Uh, so, yeah. So we appreciate the compliment. I'm glad this could be, you know, so far. So. Okay, Barb, we will talk to you soon. Okay, that was Barb Friedberg. Scott, I already knew Barb before this. What did you think of the episode? 
I, I thought she was fantastic. I think she's really smart, um, as she said so. Uh, and I think she has a really good approach to, to wealth building. I think she had really, uh, it was fun peppering her with questions and seeing her just fire off responses because um, she's clearly mastered a lot of these mental models around wealth building. Um, and I just had a great time and thought and learned a lot from her. I did too. I love her thought process. And, you know, this isn't rocket science. This isn't something you're going to have to really learn and understand. She was a financial advisor. She was a fund manager and she still invests in index funds. The, the story that she told about having the, uh, the teacher ask, who do you, who in here thinks they could beat the stock market? You're only 30% chance and your chances turn over every year. So you can't, in short, you can't beat the stock market long-term and making smart decisions so that you can hopefully match the stock market is the best way to go. Well, well guys, I, I am really interested in the, 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 exploring more deeply potentially the question that we posed to her about around like hey real estate's expensive stocks are expensive bonds are low yield inflation might be looming on the horizon what do you think you invest in or how do you think you approach that problem if different from the conservative diversified all-around approach that um barb referenced on the on the show earlier today i would love to hear your opinions and let's have a discussion on that in the bigger pockets money facebook group yes you can join our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash BP money. We're going to post this question in the Facebook group. And I would love to hear your responses because yeah, where do you put your money? Where do you plant your money so it can grow while well, everything's already grown to the top or so it seems. So um, we recorded this show at the beginning of March. I'm curious to see what happens this March because last March was uh, kind of a wild ride. So hopefully we have a very calm and boring March, but we will talk to you on April 5th in the Facebook group. Scott, should we get out of here? Let's do it. From episode 185 of the Bigger Pockets Money Podcast, he is Scott Trench, and you can find him on Instagram at Scott underscore Trench. I am Mindy Jensen, and you can find me on Twitter at Mindy at BP. And we are saying toodaloo, kangaroo.